All right. If you remember last time, we had a little bit of a dilemma concerning the way the insert worked. So let's bring it up. And let's see. If I'm not mistaken, these are the relevant pages. Let's take a look. Delete seem to work well together because both of them require you to have selected uh, a row to edit or a row to delete. So those two sort of work together on, uh, on the same details view. When we throw an insert in there, it doesn't quite work right. All right. So here's our category list coming up any, any minute now. If we select a poll from the list, we can go to it on the details page and we can edit it or delete it. But the way this is structured now, if we wanted to add a new poll, we'd have to click details, then click new. And that's sort of clunky. mention we're getting an error there, but we'll deal with that error in a, in a few minutes. In fact, if we think about it, this whole thing's awkward, because what if we did not have any polls on here and we wanted to add a poll? How do we add the first poll? Well, we can't, all right, because we're required to go to the details page to look at a poll before we can add one. So, here's what you might think of doing. Let's put a link on this page. That will take us right to poll detail. All right, seems reasonable enough. That way we don't have to select a poll to go to uh, the detail page. We can just jump right to the detail page. And we don't have to have something in this grid and click on details to get to it. So let's go in here and insert a hyperlink. And we can make the text add new poll. And we can make the navigate URL be poll detail. Now normally would pass in the query string the ID of the poll that we are inserting. Alright? But we can't do that here. Alright? We can't do that here because there is no poll that we're editing here. We're inserting a new one. Therefore there is no ID. Alright? So therefore we can just put in the name of the URL. All right, let's watch what happens now, because we're not quite there yet. We click to start debug. We get this. We click Add New Poll. And we go to the Poll Detail page, but nothing appears. Why does nothing appear? Well, right. It, 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 let, let's, let's contrast that with this. When I click on one, it's past the poll ID and it pulls this up. In other words, the way this is written, 
this grid, or I'm sorry, not grid, but details view, is expecting there to be a poll to edit. All right? So therefore, it's in read-only mode. This details view has several modes. All right? It has read-only mode. It has edit mode. And it has new mode. All right? So the problem is, is this details view, by default, is in read-only mode. Right? Read-only mode expects there to be something to show. Therefore, when there is nothing to show, it doesn't show anything. What we want to do is we want somehow the ability to get into insert mode under certain conditions. Under what conditions do we want to go into insert mode directly instead of edit mode? When there's no poll ID passed, right? We're going to get to this page two different ways. One way we're going to get to this page is by selecting a poll from the grid and clicking details. In that case, I have a poll ID, and I can pull up the poll, and I can go into read-only mode. All right? Everything's okay. The other way that I could get to this page is simply by saying I want to add a new poll. And as we said before, when you add a new poll, we don't have a poll ID. We're just calling that page. And under this circumstance, under these conditions, we don't want to go into read-only mode because there's nothing to read. There's nothing to show. We want to go instead directly into insert mode. So we have to make that happen. How do you think we're going to make this happen? What, if you think it through, we want this page to behave two different ways. One way if we're editing something, one way if we're inserting something. How do you put, have we done anything like this in the past? Use so, an if statement. Pardon me? Could you use an if statement? Okay, we use an if statement. Let's think back to where we, we did this in, in the past. Um, one time we did this in the past, if I'm not mistaken, is we showed and hid panels based on the value of a drop down. All right? So we've already done something like this where we made the page act differently depending on conditions. And that's really what we're doing. We want to control the way the page acts. That is, we want to control the properties of the different components on the page depending on some conditions. We did that way back in that early example where based on the dropdown, we showed and hid different panels on the screen. All right. Now, what we want to do is we want to make the page, uh, and, and that was based on the selection of a dropdown. This time we want to make the page look differently based on whether there's something on the query string or not. So we're going to look at the thing on the query string to determine what may, mode to go into. Now, how do we change a details view to be in insert mode or read-only mode? Any idea how to do that? I was going to say, right. You may not know how to do that, but you know this. You know that this is an object-oriented world, and the way that we manipulate the components is to look for the appropriate property. All right? So way back when we did the, um, when we did the panels example, the property we were interested in was visible property. We, we made it true, we made it false. All right? This is a little bit different. We don't want to make it visible or invisible. We want to put it in a different mode. So let's look and see. Let's look at the details view, and let's look at all the properties. And you can almost guess at the property it probably is. Access key. Yeah, that's, and it gives you a little explanation that's sometimes useful, sometimes not. That's like a keyboard shortcut to take you there. 
allow paging. That is, the, can you show the first, the second, the third, the fourth? Alternating row style, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to fast forward through these till we get to default mode. All right. Default mode can be either read only, edit, or insert. Well, it looks like we have a winner, right? Because these are the three modes that we talked about before. Now remember, and again, this goes back to some of the prep work we did. Um, you know, the first few classes of stuff that we were doing and the first few assignments we were doing didn't involve a database at all. It was just really learning about how the controls and the code behind and all that work together. Well, we saw an example, back in the panel example, that we can programmatically manipulate these properties. So, we can set the properties one way through the designer <coughs> to sort of give the default values for it. But then we can programmatically control any of the properties simply by putting code in there to access and manipulate the properties based on certain conditions. So this is a case where, how do I want to say this? I wouldn't expect you necessarily to be able to, off the top of your head, say that that property is default mode. But you know it would be a property on the details view, right, as opposed to the SQL data source. Because this has nothing to do with the data we're pulling out of the database and the data we're putting into the database. This has everything to do with the way that the user interface looks. So because of that, we know it's on the details view. And once you got it narrowed down that far, it's pretty easy to find the property. So this is an object-oriented world, and, and what part of the skills that you need to develop is to be able to scan the list of these things and determine the relevant property. So we know it's default mode, and we know it can have one of these values. All we have to do now is make it work. All right? So let me double-click to go into the page load method. That's a logical place to put this, right? Because this is right when the page loads initially. So this is something, it seems like something we want to do right off the bat. Not like after we've updated or anything along those lines, right? This is something we want to do right off the bat. So, what's our if statement going to look like? Well, it's going to start with the word if. Repeat that, please. Something about ID. Something by the query string on ID. Okay. Now, there's two objects that exist in almost every server-side language that you can think of. I mean, they exist in PHP, and they exist in all of them. Because it is something fundamental to the, to, web, to the web, and that is request and response. All right? Remember my famous diagram, which I won't draw. You should all have it burned into your retinas by now, so there's no need to draw it again. All right? A request comes from the client, gets routed to the Internet, makes it to the server. The response goes from the server back to the client. So there's objects that model that. There's objects that model that flow of the request coming in and the response going back. And they are called the request object and the response object. So anything that you want to do dealing with something that's going to be coming from the browser, and the query string is definitely something that comes from the browser, so that's going to be in the request object. All right. Anything that deals with the response going back to the client from the server is going to be in the response object. So, again, you don't really need to, you know, that gives you a head start on where you're looking uh, for this property. Yeah, go ahead. Could you say that again? Because request seems like the, the client would be requesting it is. the server. It is. The request is what the client requests from the server. The response is what the server responds to the client. Okay. All right? So, if we think about what's in the query string, what's on the query string is a request that comes from the client that says, I want 
poll detail, question mark, ID equals five. So that's part of the URL that the client requests. Therefore, the ID and, and any other fields on the query string are part of the request object. All right? So, we know that it's part of the request object just by virtue of the fact that it's coming from the browser. So, I'll looky here. Scroll down the list, and you have query string. Always takes a second to do this. Now, what do we want to check for it? All right. Well, there's a couple of ways that you could do this. Here's the way I do this. If length trim. equals zero. Oh, no, never mind. second because this isn't right so I don't want you to ask a question about something that's not correct. There we go. Okay, now you can ask your question. If you're not using a query string, it would just be a true request, I think, right? Request dot query string ID, close it in a parenthesis, that means it's true. Mm -mm. No? Okay. Well, well, yeah, that's what it would mean, except for the fact that request query string ID isn't a Boolean, right? Oh. If I do this, it's going to gripe at me saying that that is a string and I can't make a string a Boolean. So what am I doing here with all this <coughs> extra stuff? I'm getting rid of leading and trailing spaces. That's what the trim does. So if there happen to be garbage on the query string, like leading spaces or something, I'm getting rid of that. Because we probably don't want that. All right? And then I'm looking at the length of it. And if the length of it is zero, I know that there is nothing there. All right? What's the uh, ID string inside the brackets? That's the name of the field on the query string. Right? Remember, what's our URL for this? Our URL is polls detail. ASPX question mark ID equals the ID. So this is the value that I put on the query string. Or, or the value of the field on, or the name of the field that's on the query string. I get that. I'm just wondering. I don't know how to answer the question right, I guess. Okay, well, go ahead. looks for the ID parameter on there. So you could have, if you pass several things on the query string, ID, name, city, if I wanted the name, I'd say request query string, square bracket, name. So by using the query string, it knows they're separated by the ampersand? Yeah, exactly. Okay. This does the parsing for you, so you don't have to write code to like scan through it and all that. Okay. This creates what's technically known as a, an associative array or a, a hash array. You know, normally arrays are, um, normally when you think of arrays, you think of arrays as being the zeroth element, the first element. In this case, it's an array where, um, in addition to having number, because you can refer to num numeric position, like you could ask for the zeroth element on the query string. Okay. All right, the problem is, is who remembers what order you put them in, and right? And you don't always know, and if it changes and all that. 
But this is also an, this is an associative array as well, which means that instead of giving a numeric subscript, I can give like a name as a key, and that name points to a value on the query string. Sometimes that's also called a hashing uh, thing. Yeah. Is that why you're using the square brackets around it? Exactly, because this is like an array. That's why at first I, you know, in in my, uh, you know, in my confusion, I, I put parentheses around it, and it gave me an error, but it took a second, but it's like, oh, that's right. This isn't a function call, all right? This is a, an array reference, essentially. Uh, but instead of a numerical um, subscript, we're giving a, a name that's a key that points to, to that. So this will check to see if there is nothing on the query string. So if there is nothing on the query string, what does that mean? It means that we're not editing, right, because we don't have anything to edit. That means that we must be adding. So therefore, I'll take my details view one, default mode equals us in the framework with these enumerations and these, these constants. So rather than me having to memorize what is insert mode, is it an I for insert, is it the word insert, is it the number zero, I can use one of these constants and it's defined in, in a class and if I just use it everything will be okay. So details view mode is a constant and insert is a proper value that we want. So let's check this out and make sure that it works. And we have to make sure it works both ways, right? That is, we have to make sure that it works when we go into edit mode and it works when we go into insert mode. Uh, again, an if statement, you know, by definition, you know, creates a fork in the road. That you can take this path or you can take this path, all right? Therefore, by putting in a single if statement, we have effectively doubled our test cases, right? Because there's a test case when the condition is true, there's a test case when the condition is false. So in other words, don't just go into here, run it in the insert mode, say, oh, well, insert mode works, and edit mode, ho oh, oh, ho, I didn't touch that, so that still works. No, doesn't work that way. Go back and since you created sort of a fork in the road, you have to test both sides of the fork. Now, if you think about it, you know, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny program, right? This is one page that's tiny on a tiny site. When you think about all the if statements that you're going to have in a large program, how many if statements do you think there would be, say, in the code for a Microsoft Office product? Oh, it's astronomical, all right? Well, is it a wonder why sometimes programs have bugs, right? I mean, we complain about bugs and all that, but if you think of the complexity involved and, you know, you know that something small like putting an extra space in something or, or doing this or that can cause a world of trouble. Well, it's no wonder things don't work, you know? It's, you know, in some respects, it's amazing that things work as well as they do. Right? Now, that doesn't excuse us from adequately testing it just because the big boys have bugs too. But it sort of gives you a greater sensitivity for when, when things crash. You know, uh, it's like, okay, well, maybe there's some unusual circumstances. You know? All right, let's try this and see if it works.
Because it could be I'm missing something. All right, let's go here. I will go in. Add new poll. Ah, uh, this, that's null, or I'll bet. Exception object. Yeah. Okay. My bad, as the kids say. flashing back to my old traditional ASP coding days. All right, there we go. Back before they had computers to debug it. Exactly. We, we, had, we wrote and we gave it to our friend, and our friend pretended to be the computer and executed the lines of code. <laughs> Don't laugh. I mean, when I was programmed, when I, you know, okay, see, you brought it up. Now you're going to get a story. Uh, I mean, we were encouraged to do that. Play the computer. You know, take a sheet of paper out, write little boxes on your page for your variables, go through and walk through the process. And I've heard some places, like back in the old days, when computing time was scarce, that people would go and, and do that to learn how to program, because they couldn't just go and type in their code and run it and hope that it worked, all right? That you really wanted to make sure it worked. And I think that's called desk checking, I think is a formal term for it. You would go and you'd actually run through your code like that. But anyhow, so. This works, and that works too, all right? Now, there's a couple of loose ends that we have, all right? First of all, if I remember right, this didn't work when I tried to do it. Boom, it blew up, all right? Hmm, we better look and see what's wrong with that, all right? So that's the first thing that we want to hit. All right, how are we going to troubleshoot this? The error said something like it tried to give a null value to something. Okay. Well, let's get in and let's look at the SQL statement for the insert. So let's go to pull detail. And I could look at it a couple different ways. I'm going to look at it through the source view. And my insert parameter, if I look, where's my insert statement? The insert statement's part of the SQL data source. If I scroll over, my insert statement is here. Insert into poll. Poll ID, category ID, question, values, question mark, question mark. What is wrong with that? It doesn't know where to insert them into. No, it inserts them into the poll table. That part's fine. Poll ID is auto-generated. Yeah. Poll ID is auto-generated, and I don't have that on the form. So it's trying to insert it with a poll ID, um, but it doesn't have a poll ID. It really doesn't need to include the poll ID in the insert because it's an auto number field and will be auto-generated. This is why, again, it's important that you are able to read the code. It's possible that you could go through the GUI and figure this out. But remember, it's the GUI's job to hide certain ugly details from you. All right? And therefore, when you want to find something out, a lot of times, it's much more efficient just to boom, go in, look at the code, and you can see it. So how are you going to fix this? We can erase poll ID. What else do we erase? Well, we want to keep the category ID, right? One of the question marks. What else do we want to erase? In the insert parameters, we want to, end, we want to get rid of that. Remember, the insert parameters on a 
statement. This is the insert statement. We also have an update and delete statement.